Namaste friends. We are here to discuss modernism in literature in this session. Modernism may be seen as an attempt to reconstruct the world in the absence of God. And when you wish to reconstruct the world in the absence of God, you need to question everything. This is a simple definition of it. But before getting into the word modernism, let me have a little bit of analysis of the term. Modern is something that is new, that is recent, that is updated and in vogue in the contemporary context. Then what is modernity? If you wholeheartedly accept everything that is modern, then you follow the trend called modernity. In the sense, more being modern or being into modernity, we have nothing to do with tradition. We are not at war with anything that is there in our traditional back or the traditional past. In the sense, if sari is a kind of a traditional dress, that could be made modern in its own way. So we don't have any fight with wearing a sari because it could be transformed into a modern dress also. So being modern or following modernity, we don't have any kind of a fight with tradition. But when it comes to the term modernism, especially when it is attached to literature, we see that being in the world of modernism in literature is getting a big break from tradition. It is totally discarding anything that is in the tradition. It is the renunciation of tradition in general. So how is that? So right from Aristotle till the end of the Victorian age, everything that we saw was simply termed as a traditional, whether it could be lit literature or it could be literary criticism, followed the rules and principles of being traditional. But being in the field of modernism in literature, it means we no longer abide by the principles of that traditional literature or the traditional way of literary criticism. It means, let me explain. Literally getting out of the traditional world is no more believing the Victorian concept of the worship of beauty or worship of truth. Like you don't agree with what Keats said that truth is beauty, beauty, truth. You don't agree with that. You don't agree with the beautification or deification of abstract things. This is one thing. You don't belong to any kind of an indigenous culture or a native place. You have the whole world, you have the whole globe as one place. You don't have an, a fascination or an addiction to your, your nature, your place and your category, your community. You are out of it as an individual. You are no more a kind of a herd per person. You are an individualist. Okay, and third, you no more have any kind of a, a godly feeling for nature because for you in the 20th century or by the end of 19th century, nature is just nothing more than a mere commodity which could be utilized for the accumulation of wealth by the capitalists. And then when it comes to form, there is no need of a theme in any genre, whether you're writing a poem or whether you're writing a story, novel, play, you need not depend on any theme. And then when it comes to genre, you, you there is no necessity in modernism that you should follow a particular genre. You're free from following one genre in a text or in a poem. For example, if you start with a dramatic monologue, somewhere you can stop bringing the dialogue and then again the interior monologue can continue. So it is an intermixture of genres. So this is all found in modernism when it comes to literature. You literally don't agree with anything that was in the previous days up to uh, Tennyson or up to Matthew Arnold or up to Mr. and Mrs. Browning. You quit all that and you are a step ahead. Why is it so we will discuss. Now before getting into or questioning ourselves what made things uh, take a turn like this. We must uh, know what are the features of modernism uh, in literature. Uh, the first thing that I would like to discuss is uh, when you come to modern literature, uh, your first question is, does God exist? So you are into a world where you firmly believe uh, with the uh, publication of Darwin's Origin of Spaces, uh, you have a question, does something called as a creator or a universal soul really exist? So you, you develop a kind of Nietzsche's nihilism, which is completely opposite to Satra's existentialism. So you have n number of isms in the modern era. So what is nihilism? 
one, your main attribute in literature or in life, your faith itself depends on your questioning spirit. You start questioning, is this beauty? Why can't a Negro be as beautiful as the white skin? So everything is being questioned. Why is it that you need to define these particular qualities as beautiful? Why not this? So this kind of nihilistic attitude wherein Nietzsche himself writes the depth of the God. When there is no God, if you want to stand on your own, you need to question everything that you come across. So this is one of the biggest features of modernism. Second is, when you don't have God as your creator, you will have to know who you are and why you're born and what is it that you're here? Are you a little less? Are you a little more than the animals around you? Are you a beast? Or in case you're a human, you need to have a kind of a self-analysis. Then how is it that you will have a self-analysis? You need to have an exploration of the self. Exploration of the self is going back to your minds, is going back to your conscious and unconscious things. Because this was all developed with the coming of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. So you have this kind of a self-exploration thing wherein you don't have a necessarily a beginning, middle and end. Because when it comes to the mind, it has no space, it has no limited area. There is no restriction, there is no sacrifice. Everything is open. So the kind of a self-exploration or analysis that you have is totally different from person to person. This is the second thing that you find in modernistic literature or when you apply modernism to uh, literature as a theory. And the third thing you have the development of technology. Your whole life now with the capital, capitalistic attitude or industrialization of entire Europe and the world, your whole life depends on technology. So you want to earn a little bit of living, you need to depend on technology. So now it is technology that gives life. So somewhere in the minds of the modernist thinkers and writers and readers, you see technology as God. It is technology that is giving you bread, not nature or any morals or any ethics. So extreme dependence on technology uh, is not just machine or machinery, but the kind of education that is technically based, based on certain set of scientific principles. You have the invention of the film, you have the invention of the radio, you have the invention of photography. And the coming of photography, you, you just can't imagine. There was a time uh, when Wordsworth said that you just need to go back, recollect what you saw and reproduce in your words. There is no need because you have the picture of what you have seen already in front of you. So where is the need to po polish your imagination? So with these kinds of inventions, you don't depend on uh, what the Victorians or the Romantics said about life or about nature. So this was a kind of a reaction to photography invention of photography strange thing in literature and then since you don't have God you have all kinds of isms on which you'll have to rely in literature what is that uh, you have absurdity in poetry uh, or in fiction writing so what is absurdity in your previous days when you wrote some traditional literature or even today when you read traditional literature you have forms like sonnet ode elegy ballad wherein the, the, the form is so strict unto itself. You need to follow that in case you want to follow the genre or a style. That is no more available here. You, you are free to write a free verse. You begin with a ballad, you end with a ode. And there is nothing called as a sonnet in modern times. So absurd beginnings. And the novel writing doesn't depend on beginning, middle or end. It could begin in the end and it could end somewhere in the middle reflecting the beginnings somewhere by the edge of the middle. So there is no structure and it doesn't depend on one theme. Absurdity in the sense a story is an intermixture of various stories. So how could you say that this book has this particular thing as a theme? Because in our previous days when we read Shakespeare and we read, when we read Milton, when we read so many novelists of Jane Austen, we used to think that this is the particular theme. The first thing that teaches you is to introduce us to the theme and plot of the story. This is nowhere found because of the absurd style that we have in uh, poetry and uh, fiction or in uh, uh, even in um, uh, playwriting you must have read the waiting for Godo so what, what is that you wait and wait and wait for God and he never comes but then your life is over so these kinds of inventions you see in absurdity and then what else you have in literature you have formalism you don't depend on one language if your book uh, stresses English language it could have some reminiscences of French 
Latin, Greek or Indianized Sanskrit. So anything, a book could be of any language. It could highlight, it could be called as an English book, but not necessarily one language. And then you could have dense vocabulary. Uh, something like what Shashi Tharoor uses today, wherein even dictionaries are incapable of explaining the terms. And then as I told you, it doesn't have a form. It could be open-ended, it could be closed-ended. It's all left, as Bartha said, the death of the author. It's up to the hands of the reader. So this is a formalism. And then you have a symbolism of T.S. Eliot, wherein words don't speak, the pictures, the imagination, the symbol itself talks about uh, what is what in a poem. So excessive use of symbolism uh, in T.S. Eliot, like he, he uses the cat imagery, door imagery, he uses some strange imageries, wherein somehow you could recollect John Donne, but John Donne was far better than T.S. Eliot because he at least described, he explained, he just manipulated with his uh, symbolism but with the coming of T.S. Eliot there are layers of meaning in symbolism. So when it comes to imagery, it could be simile getting mixed with a hyperbole or a hyperbole getting mixed with a metaphor and you do not know what kinds of similes are being used as imagery. So that is also a different thing. So thematically, structurally, everything changed so much. As I said, there was absurdity, there was symbolism, there was imagery and there was themelessness and there was psychoanalytical approach, gender approach. So whole of the modern literature are focused on something which we literally couldn't grasp in our hands. So, so this is how uh, we can see the beginnings of uh, modern literature are. But then what led to all this kind of things that we have discussed in other theories also that World War I was the greatest influence uh, behind taking away uh, God from the minds and hearts of the people. Because uh, when World War took one, humans had no concern for other humans. There was such a strict segregation of we and you. Like in, in our days, we used to think that these are the elite people, these are the aristocratic people, and these are the popular generation. These are the lower class people. But soon after the uh, World War One, people came together, the rich and the poor equally came together for no cause, for no goal, but to kill each other. So all the faith that we had in a kind of a humanitarian approach before the First World War was lost. So ultimately it was not just loss of faith in God, but loss of faith in oneself and the fellow beings around him. So this could be a kind of a rejection of everything that was there because for now, for the modern writers and the modern readers, uh, there was no set principles, so there was no heritage to follow. They were left in limbo. They Even uh, scientists like Newton said that uh, Earth uh, has its own uh, theories of, uh, you know, it has its own gravitational pull and it is in nowhere in the hands of God. So many strange things cropped up with the World War I. And as I said, the heavy um, enhancement of capitalism, accumulation of wealth, the nature was no more a god. It was just a commodity in the hands of all those people who wanted to exhaust its raw materials. And then the segregation of employers, employees, the proletariat, the bourgeois kind of a capitalistic approach which led to kind of a terrorism in the entire European world and affected other colonies of uh, Europe also and then apart from that you had the development of technology as I said man uh, had no roots in the earth man had no roots neither in heaven nor on earth nor in hell because he was supposed to be a product of uh, either Charles Darwin or Newton so where was he in between uh, was he a product of his unconscious or was he a product of something outside him was all kind of a question because he's left going to the churches. He had no more faith in his Bible. So these are some of the features which led to the development of modernism in the 20th century and the latter half of the 19th century. So how do we study this modernism in literature? Because as you see, soon after the coming of Fried and Jung, we see a kind of a, a modernistic uh, psychoanalytic uh, writing being very popular. Somewhere, uh, if uh, uh, someone asks me, I would simply answer that modernism is equal to psychoanalytic literature. Because much that we find in modernism is all dependent on the layers and layers 
layers of the human psyche. So for me, what attracts me uh, to the modernistic reading is simply uh, the theories of Freud and Jung and their subconscious, unconscious and superconscious areas. So let us take one or two examples and go on studying. So if you take T.S. Eliot's uh, The Love Song of J. Uh, Alfred Prufrock, so then he is a kind, we'll just, we'll just analyze what is there in the poem, you will understand. He is a kind of a middle-aged person and he has been wanting to love someone and get married in life. But then he is so independent and he is so much removed from the world. He is so much solitary because he believes that he, he loves to be like that. That he sometimes feels a need for a woman and sometimes doesn't feel because somewhere he also finds a woman in himself also. So that is kind of a gender crash that one single individual had in those days. So when he goes and sits in the hotel and he calls it as tea time. Tea time is a kind of symbolism or this word is used as imagery also. For us, uh, tea time could be a kind of a fun time or a spending a, a jovial time with the friends. But here for Prufra, tea time sitting all alone at a distance from a group of women, watching them not as women in whole, but either watching their eyes or watching their nose or watching their ears. That means he can accept a bit of a woman, but not woman as a whole. Somewhere his capacities as a man would be challenged or somewhere the demands of a woman could, couldn't be fulfilled in his subconscious. So whether to accept a woman or not, he's a kind of a hamlet in the whole poem. And then when he's walking on the roads, he's so scared when someone passes him or someone overtakes him. He's so stealthily living a life. So the life that is shown there is most of the times the life of the Ireland, uh, in which James Joyce also wanted to show in, in, in his novels. So Proof Rock also speaks about a, a kind of a spot in his head which is called as Bard. So now in wanting to love, wanting to get married, somehow he consoles himself that he is getting aged. So the indecisiveness of a man, the intentions being turned in the conscious level of the man are all shown even in the wasteland of T.S. Eliot. In the wasteland, he speaks of water imagery, he speaks of singing and dancing as imagery, but for no benefit of man. In olden days when we used water, we used it as a symbol of life-giving source, but in wasteland we see that water comes as flood and we get drowned into it. So nothing is positive. And when uh, in, a Shakespeare, in, a, in a Shakespearean tragedies uh, we thought of chorus, there were a kind of a transition, a connection between the readers and the audience and the actors. But then uh, the, the singers that we have in Wasteland or Proof Rock are all the time alarming you that you don't belong, you don't belong to the world of the music, you don't belong to the world of joy. So much of stress you find when you read modernistic literature of T.S. Eliot and of course he uses the Sanskrit words, he uses Latin, Greek words in his poetry. So each word stands for the culture of that particular country. There is intermixture of cultures, intermixture of genres, intermixture of languages and intermixture of symbols from various different lands. So all together, there is nothing called a kind of an end to a poem. There is nothing called as end to a story. Somewhere it stops and then there are a thousand questions left in your mind. So there is no end, especially in the modern literature. You don't have anything called an end to a book or a poem or a story. So this is how. And if you pick James Joyce, uh, before I should, uh, I forget, I must tell you that uh, in America, it was in America that this modernism started. And uh, Emily Dickinson could be called as the mother of modernism and Walt Whitman could be called as the father of uh, modernism. Uh, because uh, if you take Emily Dickinson and the death of God concept of Nietzsche, there is a comparison for Emily Dickinson. God could be her neighbor. God could be her chariot. God could be her lover. And she was an ardent follower of Jesus Christ. She went to her church. But then the, what was her uh, perspective towards God is all there in her poems. Again, there you have lots of uh, paraphrases. You, you have parentheses in her poems. You have so many capital letters in the in the middle of the sentence and you have so many dashes or colons in Emily Dickinson's poems that you end, don't end up with any single theme in her poems. All about mortality, immortality, life after death, death after life. So many things are being dealt. 
in just one single poem. So somehow that was a kind of a, a kind of a psychoanalytic uh, range found in American poetry that goes with Walt Whitman also. But coming back to the European English production, you can say Virginia Woolf as the mother of modernism here. You can call James Joyce as the father of modernism here because it was with Virginia Woolf that uh, we started to understand what is stream of consciousness. Because in stream of consciousness, you 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 just imagine you are an 80 years old and very next moment you think you are just 80 years old and very next moment you'll be flirting with someone thinking that you are 18 years old. So then the lifespan and the coming and going behind in the conscious levels is all about stream of consciousness and there is no single storyline as I said in the beginning. And if we pick up uh, James Joyce's uh, Dubliners, it is a collection of 15 uh, psychoanalytical stories, very difficult to understand as to why why it begins and why it ends like that. So one or two we can pick and discuss. There is a story called Araby uh, wherein it has a kind of an eastern influence on it. There is a boy, uh, this is the story of uh, some village in Ireland and the Irish culture. Uh, there, is, there are two, three lanes mentioned in the story. Uh, where is um, a meager, low class life. Uh, there is a boy who still goes to the school. He is not even a youth now. And there is a girl just uh, uh, in front of his house who doesn't have a name. She is just called as Mangan's sister and the boy is just a kind of a narrator. And then the names are not disclosed in the sense it could be anybody. It could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody, it could be a neighbor also. So he kinds, uh, develops a kind of a crush for the girl. The girl's name is not said. I told you he's Mangan's sister. So Mangan could be his friend and uh, she is the sister of his friend. But she's quite old to him because she's already... Uh, uh, working in a convent and uh, he doesn't have the guts to talk to her but he can happily see her body movements like uh, her body movements have started ruling his life everything goes in the psyche of the boy and one fine day somehow he meets the girls and talks with her for the first time but the girl has nothing to talk about her emotions or about her feelings towards the boy she knew the boy looked at her but the only question that he questions to him is have you been to the bazaar? It's open on Saturdays and, and I've heard it's going to be a nice thing there. I'm so sorry I couldn't attend the bazaar because I have some work with the convent. So the bazaar itself was Arabi, which was full of the Eastern commodities, uh, something that mesmerizes the Western people. So now he is, wishes that he should bring something for her and win over her heart. And then he, uh, he uh, requests his uncle and aunt to uh, give him some money and then uh, at last the Saturday arrives and he's so late arriving to Arabi, to the mall. That's almost the closing time and almost all the shops are closed and one or two shops could be seen who don't have any interest in the coming customers then because it's already dark and the lights are getting off and before he could see what is available in bazaar, he, he, he just comes across again the western commodities and the, the, the kind of a torn feeling that he has that uh, he, the, 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 the feeling that he had for the eastern commodities, the feeling that he had for the eastern kind of love all vanishes all of a sudden in the bazaar itself. The story stops there. You do not know whether the boy carried something back to the girl or whether it was a kind of a, a, a kind of an alienation for the boy from the girl because uh, the girl was totally western and the boy had some eastern feelings in him and even in the bazaar he could not buy anything because every Everything was western. So the very looks of the bazaar or the mall is a kind of a, a renunciation in the mind of the boy that even if he gets the girl in his life, she will in no way be uh, attempting to fulfill the needs or his aspirations. So difficult for the readers to understand because it's an intermixture of traditions and it all takes place in the minds and there is no end as to what happened to the boy or what happened to the girl. It was a kind of a renunciation. All of and how could that happen just in a day's time? So this is all a review that the readers themselves have to make. So even in another story of uh, James Joyce which is called as Dead, this is also from Dubliners, wherein after a party the husband and wife have happily returned back home and uh, husband wants to make love to his wife and she's crying and when there is a question as to what made her cry after so much of enjoyment, uh, she says uh, when she saw someone singing in the party, she remembered her first love, she remembered how for the first time someone had proposed her and he was standing and begging for her love. Uh, below her window and it was so uh, dense that day it was raining and it was drenched and the next day before she could answer
also him uh, because of standing whole day, whole night in the rings. He had died, and now that she remembers him, uh, this is how she feels a kind of an affiliation for the dead. So there is a person who he wants to love, who wants to give her what she wants, but she is in the uh, agony of the dead person. So the name of the story itself is dead. So the living become dead, and the dead become alive in the conscience of the mind. This is all because of a torn tradition. This is all because of the alienation from the God that we have. So these kinds of psychoanalytical stories. we find in modernism so now there is another concept with the coming of machiavelli's uh, he being a political leader his publication of his prince so what did he say in that all the developing capitalism the urbanization the privatization the globalization all this is going to lead us to some reasoning in the end even this could give us a kind of a better life so let's have hope in capitalism let us hope in industrialization with a positive outlook when his book was published people were again in a flux it was a age with opposed capitalism but there were great people who were upheld in that and then that led to the writings of karl marx and that led to the writings of john ruskin where in immediately there is a shift from psychoanalysis we fall into a kind of a socio economic crisis we do not know whether we are happy being rich or happy being poor so the difference between the rich and the poor was such an extent that was it was intermixed with what freud and jung had told us before and then immediately we have a shift to newton we have descartes we have kant these are all scientific writers and they said that it is all science that is ruling us so we will have a god in the field of science we will have remedies for all our problems only in the hands of science so why hate science so let us shun the tradition let us shun everything that controlled us till day except science wholeheartedly and then came uh, the novels of h g wells which taught us tele portation telepathy telekiosis it told about the different worlds different uh, planets and the kind of aliens and the feeling that we are just a part of a space where in many other uh, uh, humans exist around the planets and going to some other planet everything was a kind of a crux that the till day we used to think that we are the only existing humans on earth but there are some other earths there are some other parts of the universe wherein there are aliens far more superior to us and i'm telling this what is god's intention if he has created us so the all the intermixture of the psychoanalytics the socio economic crisis the scientific growth together led to the growth of modernistic literature in the second half of 19th century and the whole of 20th century so uh, even today when we read this books we have a kind of a questioning as do we live in a world which still believes in god or uh, are we are so independent that we are no more than beasts so this is how the more of the reading of modernist texts we come to know the concept the theory of modernism So hope you all understood what I really wanted to speak here thank you children